Hello, everyone. Welcome to this evening's scroll event titled Fiction, Performance, and Poetry, where we have Arundhati Subramaniam in conversation with Shoykot Mojumdar about his latest novel, The Middle Finger. Uh, just to quickly introduce our speakers, Arundhati Subramaniam is a poet, critic, and curator whose most recent work includes women who wear only themselves and love without a story. Shoykot Mojumdar is a novelist, critic, and professor. He has authored four novels and four books of nonfiction. His most recent novels, both of which are with Simon & Schuster, are titled The Middle Finger and The Scent of God. I'll uh, hand it over to them. Hi. <laughs> um, hi. Hi, Arundhati. Yeah. Um, you know, um, over to you. I mean, I'm really glad, um, you know, we are doing this conversation and I'm very glad I'm doing this with you because um, obviously there are so many things we've had overlapping interest with religion, poetry, and, um, and I'm glad that I'm here in conversation with you. I'd like to also like to thank uh, both Scroll and Sam and Schuster for hosting this, Mega for introducing us and the whole team in Simon and & Schuster uh, and the school for doing this. So I'm, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts around the thing. <laughs> Shaikat, I'm afraid there's a problem with the audio. I cannot hear a word. So we need to figure out how to, I think I'm going to just get out of this and log in again and see if it works. Okay. Oh, I, I can hear you perfectly well though. So, Well, let's hope um, Arundhati is able to join us soon. And um, and thanks um, everybody for being here. Um, uh, I think we are getting to a point where we are getting ready for physical events. But um, you know, I think uh, in many ways um, this is a perfect um, gathering for, especially for a book like this, when you know poetry and its performative life is um, central to it. Uh, Arundhati, um, uh, yeah, I think uh, you, somebody needs to let, let Arundhati in. I can see she's asking to be let in. Um, Megha and Karnika. Okay, the microphone.
Hi, I'm so sorry for this. This really never happens. Um, so I guess while we are waiting for Arundhati, uh, why don't we just like you know get to know a little bit about you, and uh, why don't you just tell our viewers, uh, you know, a little sort of like intro and you know what your book is all about, and we're like really looking forward to read it. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's some of the things Arundhati wanted to ask me. That how did this get started? And I think, um, I think for the longest time, I, I mean, I wanted to write. I guess a book about a university campus was inside me because that's a world I know very well. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, you know, I, it, it, it started with a kind of a desire to retell the Ekalavya story in a contemporary campus, and I thought, you know. Um, it's a fascinating story from the myth, and um, and it's really about equity and access to education and to the teacher, and these are such um, powerful realities in campuses worldwide. That who gets access to education, who gets access to certain forms of knowledge, and um, and, and 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 as I started writing it, I realized that you know I'm not exactly a myth writer. I'm too committed to contemporary reality, so mm. things change. But at the same time, these debates much around us, um, especially even after the academic Me Too movement, the questions about what are the, what are the limits of power and intimacy between the teacher and the student. And I think the theme of mentorship, which I think is um, pretty much everywhere, not just in the world of academia, but the mm-hmm. corporate world, political world. So it's everywhere. And, um, and then I think, you know, things just grew out of that. And um, it's a, it's very different because you know my novels usually come from a scrap of reality, but uh, this one I almost felt mm-hmm. like I had this story inside me. Um, but of course, as mm-hmm. I started writing, the characters always run away from you. You know, you have something in mind, and I think um, you know a novel is really working when you start to lose control. You start to lose control over the characters; mm-hmm. they get alive, and that um, eventually happened with it. So, um, mm-hmm. so yeah, I mean, um, so uh, I think one of the things that uh, a lot of authors have mentioned, and we use regularly hold these conversations, is that everyone does miss that offline event, right? You get to meet people, you get to meet readers, and so how different is it? Uh, you know, like one writing in a pandemic, and second, uh, you know, just like talking about your book, and now we're all just doing online events, and so. Uh, like do you feel like something gets lost in translation between online and offline i think it's very disembodying but i think on on the um, you know there's the certain things the pandemic has been obviously devastating in so many counts i had personal losses myself but one thing is for sure it has pushed us far ahead in terms of technology and i think the kind of connections we can make without the barrier of space is, and that's going to stay. I think even after we go back offline, I think this is not something we are giving up. I work at the university. I know mm-hmm. that one, you can have people from different countries. You can connect. And um, and yeah, I mean, and I think our sense of social belonging has also changed, that we um, don't miss people in the same way. Of course, there's nothing like a... So I think we all miss the um, physicality. And hi, Arundhati. Good to have you back. <laughs> hi, you shortcut. I'm a, and apologies for my absence. It's taken me time to figure this out. And I'm now joining you on my telephone, on my cell phone. So hopefully this will work. That's so nice. uh, I'm sorry. Tell me what's been happening for the past 10 minutes and I'll figure out where, where I can insert um, myself. We were just making small talk, but I just started to talk about the book a little bit. But, um, you know, how, how I came to it. And of course, the strangely disembodying feeling of online events. So that's where we are. And of course, very appropriately, you're now with us. So it's not so disembodying, thankfully. <laughs> yes. Well, let's hope this lasts. And, um, you know, if I can come in at this point, Shaikat, I want to just start first really by congratulating you. Because I'm not sure that's something you'd have been able to do in your introduction to this book. I mean, for these past 10 minutes, that's clearly not something you've done. I want to hold up this book and say how special it is and how special it feels to have this conversation with you. Having read an early draft of the book, there was something particularly exciting about actually receiving this tangible um, avatar of the manuscript now in my hands. So congratulations. It's beautifully produced. And... um, 
I just want to take a moment, if I may, Shaikat, before we actually get into this conversation. I want to just take a moment to say something about what that early draft that you sent um, meant to me. And, uh, and then, of course, what this particular book means to me. And then, of course, we'll open this up. And I'm looking forward to hearing a lot more from you uh, about the book. And I hope you will be reading from it as well. But what I wanted to say is that um, when I read a book, and this could be, this is maybe part of my training as a poet and as a reader of poetry, I always look for the text within the text, as it were, by which I mean that there's always a kind of ur text that one feels one can sniff out if one looks deep enough or hard enough. You know, I've always been fascinated by the idea, for instance, that so many temples in this country have a, an occult shrine. The real mother shrine is at some remove from the popular shrine that's visited by devotees, for instance. So I'm always looking for that mother text that gave rise to a poem or to a novel or to a, any story or a work of prose, nonfiction. And so I look for, when I read about a character, I'm always looking for an archetypal precursor. When I read about a conflict or a dilemma, I'm always looking for its um, more existential mainsprings. And so when I read this first draft of your novel, I remember the epigraph that pointed to a particular mythic um, underpinning. But it was as I started reading the book, and there's a point in the narrative where the narrative just swivels on its heel. And it's an explosive moment in the text. And that's when the whole story, again, the myth uh, that animates this novel in so many ways, the myth of Ekalavya, the story of Ekalavya and um, Dronacharya sort of came back to me powerfully. And to me, these were the questions that moved me and that to me churn at the heart of your novel, really. They were questions about, at least the novel provoked me to ask these questions about what it is really, who is the modern day Dronacharya? What are the seductions? What are the potential areas of uh, corruption that might confront the modern day teacher? And who is the modern day Bhil? Who is the Ekalavya whom we might overlook despite all our avowed um, ethical conscientiousness and political correctness and moral vigilance, who are the figures that we relegate to the periphery of our vision and why? Mm -hmm. Those questions, as well as even the more fundamental question of what is knowledge anyway? And can there be a knowledge that is, that can be transmitted except through body? Can there be knowledge without body, without desire, without love? And even more fundamentally, the distinctions that your characters draw, and I want to mention two of them here, that moved me, that spoke to me deeply, the distinction between a shiny, smart, edgy cleverness, Megha in your novel calls a snarky and snappy uh, intelligence, that on the one hand versus a darker, more stained, more lived in, more internalized wisdom. That distinction spoke to me deeply. And also the distinction between teaching and transmission, between knowledge as acquisition and knowledge as a kind of self-emptying the dance between learning and unlearning that lies at the heart of any um, process of education, really. So these were questions that uh, spoke to me, that provoked me, that disquieted me. And I think they spoke to me as both poet and a seeker. And um, I hope we're going to be able to discuss much of this uh, during this conversation, Shaikat. I'm going to just start by asking you, and I'm not sure whether you've already addressed this, perhaps not. I'm just going to start by asking you, because I have read your earlier novel as well, The Scent of Desire, I want to know something about your journey from that novel to this one. 
And can you tell us really about the beginnings of this one? How did it all start? Right. No, thank you, Arundhati. That's such an incredibly moving and probing reading. And it's not surprising at all because it's, these are some of the things we both shared as writers, faith, and of course, especially this novel, performance and poetry. And I remember when you read that early draft, without that epigraph, you actually mentioned, you're the only person who actually mentioned that 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 Ikalave like dilemma that Trona. And you mentioned that somehow you noticed it even without my referencing. So I think that really mm -hmm. struck me that it stood out to you. Um, I also should say that you, since you mentioned the cover, I really want to thank uh, Simon and Schuster and the cover designer Pinake Dave for really doing a beautiful job. And I really like the way they've done the the eye, the eye obviously, the doubleness of the eye and the second cover inside. I mean, I, I'm very moved by that yes. that it has a second cover, and the second cover and the first cover is clearly the two characters. It sort of begins to tell the story. Um, so yeah, I think uh, you read it, you know, in a way that it's kind of a dream reading. I mean, more than what I had in mind myself. That kind of, um, but I think it's very different from my previous novels, and in this, especially from the Scent of God, because I have been a kind of a writer who is inspired by atmosphere. For me, people when people ask me that, what drives you? Is it a story, characters? I say it's atmosphere, and of course, characters rooted in atmosphere. So with, for instance, my second mm. novel, the it was this moment of theater, a child watching a mother die on stage, and that fear. And in the center of God, it was this maddening mix of desire and religion, in this kind of desire in an atmosphere of religion that really drove me. That atmosphere, which I also obviously personally knew, you know, having been to that school. And I mean, a lot of my novels come from this scrap of memory. Even if I make up the story, the setting is something I have lived myself. So that physicality of that memory is very important to me. This novel was very different because, as I was just telling before you came in, it really came to me as a desire to tell the Ekalavya story on a contemporary university campus. I think the Ekalavya story is such a powerful story. We grow up with it. We, you know, we have Dronacharya awards in this country. And the theme of mentorship, of course, going back to the Greek mentor, Greek myth of the mentor, you know, and as well as everywhere, right, from the corporate world to the idea of somebody, it's such a powerful thing. And especially, obviously, you know, the limits of that relationship after the academic Me Too um, movement has kind of sort of blown open a lot of things, you know, it's going on all the time. And it's the power relationship with it. I felt I needed to write something about it, you know, and even the question, the ekalave like question that, you know, who gets access to a teacher, you know, who do you have to be, do you have to, and these are questions we sometimes face too. We face a student who we feel we don't know what to do with because their teaching is especially teaching in the arts, as I'm sure you know really well. Is there, there are questions of legacy, there are questions of, you know, when you think of something like dance, there's so many questions of, you know, legacy and um, ownership, aesthetic ownership. It's not something like engineering that you can just go and, you know, learn like that. You know, arts have a certain mm -hmm. cultural baggage with it. So I felt like I wanted to write this story, but I was also very moved by a particular retelling of the Ekalavya's myth, which Wendy Doniger offers in the book Hindus where she talks about this Jain retelling, where it's actually very interesting. It's Arjun who actually cheats Ekalavya. It's not thrown. Mm. It's mm -hmm. obviously very Ekalavya and makes him give up his thumb. Arjun knows nothing about this. And mm. when he comes to know this, he gets very angry at Arjun. He said that you sneaky urban crook, you have deceived this innocent tribal you know, warrior. And from now on, I'm going to give this boon that the bheel which is interesting because in Mahabharata, Ekalave is Nishad. Here is called Bheel. Yes, and I, which is why I mentioned the Bheel at the start because I noticed this is a lovely excerpt. Do you want to read it? It's a lovely um, excerpt that you have in your epigraph. I will read that. And this is the um, you know little um, epigraph that I've used uh, at the beginning. Uh, Drona went there and asked the Bheel, where is your guru? And the Bheel showed him the representation that he himself had made and told him what he had done, saying, Arjuna, this is the fruit of my bhakti. But the sneaky, cheating Arjuna said to him, Bheel, with your great zeal, you must do puja with the thumb of your right hand for the Drona whom you met through us. The Bheel said yes and did it. But then the Guru said, Arjuna, you're a sneaky urban crook and you have deceived the artless, honest, unsophisticated forest dweller. 
But my favor, even without a thumb, these people will be able to shoot arrows. And as he said this, the guru gave the bheel this favor and went back to his own place. And so even today, a bheel can shoot arrows using his middle finger and his forefinger. So that's the origin of the title, not the middle finger as we imagined yes. it. No, I have no problem yes. in thinking of that middle finger in connection well. to, you know, mm -hmm. that root of that un unexpected disruptive power that I think is totally fine, that showing that of, yes. of establishment. But, uh, you know, with it, of course, you know, when I imagined, I wanted to write a story where Drone sided with Ekalavya. Drone actually supported mm -hmm. Ekalavya. And that mm -hmm. ironic reflected through the second epigraph, which is from Plato's Symposium, which I'm not going to read out, but Plato says playfully that, oh, I'm going to lie down next to you and knowledge will flow through Agathon. He's telling Agathon in the Symposium. So there, this kind of idea that knowledge travels through a certain erotic connection, which obviously with Plato, you know, it's quite fascinating. So in, in some ways, these two myths, rather the retold myth of Ekalavya and this Platonic myth got mixed up. And then I started oh. writing I realized that, um, you know, in the end, it's a much more contemporary story. I think, I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking actually of, you know, a poem you wrote, you know, how to read Indian myth, you know, make it, read it like a love story, your own. You kind of make myths your own. You, you know, characters become their own characters. They don't follow the script. So there was yeah. an initial interest, but I think it has ended up being a very contemporary story with the echo of mentorship and the myth uh, at the back. So thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. And it also struck me as interesting, if I remember right, in the bio note that accompanies your book, Sharkat, it doesn't mention that you actually teach yourself and you are a professor at Ashoka University, which I think would be an interesting, uh, you know, point of reference for those who actually read the book and find, you know, for me, the parallel is obvious, and I'm sure it is for you, and you're going to be asked this question a great deal, so I may as well ask it now. You know, uh, Megha, your character, teaches at Harappa University in Haryana, is it, or outside Delhi? So right. the, the question then is really, was this vital to your text from the start? And to what degree has your own um, life and position as teacher had an impact on this work? Right. I mean, Megha is very much a fictional character, but she has been to spaces I have been. I mean, again, I, I am very place driven. So I need to know the place with a certain amount of I, I admire writers who are who can write speculatively, but I need to know the place. And I think I've been to many places. So I think they've kind of come back. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I mean, I before coming to Ashoka, I taught for nine years at Stanford. And then at Ashoka, so these are institutions of a certain kind. They are very elite spaces. And not just financially, because it's financial things can be addressed by scholarship, but you really need a certain kind of education, a certain kind of K-12 education to even imagine yourself, you know, to, to kind of go to a place like that. You know, that's, and I think, um, and, and at Ashoka, I think it has been especially uh, sensitive because India has had a very Nehruvian socialist l landscape. You know, we all got excellent education in public education system practically for free, and I'm grateful for that. And now to have an exclusive um, private space, which is fairly expensive, but more than that, having a very different kind of model of education, which is still very alien to most Indians. So I think the questions of equity are inevitable. You know, we are yeah. other side of Delhi and on the southern side, there's an institution like JNU, which is very close to my home, you know, clearly. And, and at the same time, the last five, six years have been so explosive for Indian higher education for so many reasons for political reasons, for questions of excess, questions of elitism. So I think these are questions that are all around me, you know, very much around me. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I yes. obviously took fictional liberty in the portrayal of Harappa University. You know, I think it's clear. But um, I think the point is not, and there might be themes and characters who are recognizable you know in, in this novel too but I think it's a really important moment I think in in India that when a middle class expands to be able to afford a certain kind of an education what does it mean for the rest of the country mm -hmm. and this seemed to me perfect setup for a Drona Pandava setup where you know the Drona mm -hmm. uh, teaches the Pandava and it's a very exclusive setup and when someone like Ikalavya comes in and this is something which many of us deal with even in a not just in a question of excess but in a pedagogic sense you know there have been times mm -hmm. when 
I have met a student, and especially that happens if you're teaching a subject like English, which is very, mm. very elite in certain ways. Mm. A certain student comes to you, they have an incredible native intelligence, but they simply haven't come from the kind of a background where, you know, English means the same thing to many of us who grew up with it as a part of our life. Now, the question yeah. is, and this is going be many of us, not just me at Ashoka, a lot of us think about it. How does one make that accessible? And I think this mm-hmm. is what happens. Poonam asks Megha that, oh, I want to learn. And Megha simply misunderstands that she wants to learn English. And, and there she's like, oh, English is the language of upward mobility. Everybody wants to learn English to get a job, to get married, to do call centers. But that's not what Poonam wants. She wants to be creative. She wants to be creative. Yeah. And creativity is, of course, linked to her faith, which I think is beyond Megha to understand because she's a very secular mm-hmm. person. But for her, uh, that is that moment of confusion for a teacher when you face a student like that i think is very real and that that is that has a kind of spiritual reality it is not necessarily something like this actually happened but that echo is very genuine for me yes and in fact uh, that brings me to you know i hope we have the time to discuss all of this but you know some of the themes that uh, you mentioned right now you know, when you touched on the spiritual, it struck me when reading the book initially in the first half of the book, I thought that the themes were largely uh, themes of about the ethical and then the erotic. So in a sense, dharma and kama, the way I, I saw it in my mind. And then came the whiff of moksha as a possibility. There is someone with what can best be described as a spiritual journey. And she seems to be on that. That's what Poonam represents. And that's what she seems to bring into that, uh, into the sermon that um, we later hear her deliver. And I wanted to ask you about this aspect, uh, Shaikat, because here I see that the question of faith enters your text, but it is also faith that so um, integrally went wedded to the idea of, again, of the mentor. You know, coming back to the idea of Dronacharya, what is, who is the mentor? There is Megha as a kind of self-conscious pedagogue. And then there is Megha as the inadvertent conduit of something she's not even aware of, which is why I wanted to make that distinction at the start between teaching and transmission. Because although Plato invokes it somewhat ironically, the fact is that a process of transmission does take place here, which Megha is not even aware of. So, you know, can we talk about faith and mentorship at this point and yes. how you saw these two playing out? Absolutely. And Thanks as you me. answer, I just want to let you know that I may vanish for a moment, but I'm listening. I need to make sure the phone is charged. So oh, on that sure. note. Sure. No, I think I, I'm absolutely right. I think the question of faith, and this is what I think we've been talking about, you know, your, your writing on Bhakti poetry and my last novel, The Scent of God, it's been a very... It, Important connection, I think, there, um, you know, I think when you wrote about the woman saint, I mean, those are the connections I think I, I found with your poetry as well. Uh, but yeah. for this particular novel, I was thinking about what faith means to marginal people. I think we yeah. are living in a country where obviously we desperately need a secular or at least a pluralistic public sphere. And yet yeah. secularism remains a kind of a um, privilege of a certain bourgeois person. Uh, everywhere in the world, you know, whether it's if you go to African American churches in the U.S. or you know certain marginalized people, people so to say who are excluded from the sort of the scope of modernity, faith is very important. And that I think you know, what I wanted was, you know, what is the relationship between faith and art? This was also my concern in the sense of God that why and I'm not, I cannot call myself a believer, but I I'm fascinated by religion, and it's and it's force on artistic life, music, you know, poetry, sculpture, architecture, dance, all these forms have been so shaped by religion. I think I've been very shaped by that. And here, I, I was particularly interested in the genre of the church. So I love going to churches. I've been to many churches in North America, in India. And the church sermon seems to me such a powerful poetic utterance. Yes. This is what happens so that I see Poonam as happening as a, obviously as a tribal person who is a Christian person. Uh, she wants to speak about God. She wants to speak about mm-hmm. God. And, um, you know, uh, and this is inseparable in her mind from a certain kind of poetry. So that sermon she utters is the poetic utterance, but it's an act of faith. 
And that is where I think Megha, imagine Megha as a character who can't quite grasp what this means. That because mm -hmm. she cannot for her, and it's a kind of a it's a kind of a almost a disembodying experience for her. That how, and I think there's a part where she's talking to Jishnu that you know, like we can't do this. And for her, it's not like she admires religion; she doesn't believe in it. But this is powerful no. self negation. That this kind of that giving up of oneself that I'm nothing before this powerful presence and that creates a certain kind of artistic persona whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing i believe in religion i'm suspending all of that but this no, self creates a yeah. certain kind of poetic utterance which i think is mm -hmm. very important and this is again you know this is where you know she's talking about um that i learned you know in spite of your rejection i got your book of poems and i read your book of poems and this is my take on the Ekalavya learning from the clay image of the guru that I learned even though he didn't know that I learned from you. And that mm -hmm. learning itself is a kind of a blow for um for uh, for Megha, who is a yeah. Yes. And also that distinction that I think it's Megha in her conversation with Jishnu and Sonalika, I think that's where it comes up, where they talk about uh, a kind of knowledge that is born of, of the emptying of the self. So it struck me that there are various kinds of knowledge that you're actually implicating here. There is, on the one hand, the written word, which has its own place because of mm -hmm. Megha's poetry. There is the spoken word, which all of them engage in, I mean, the conversations between the characters. Also, Megha's poetry is performed. So there is the performative aspect. And then it seems to me that your novel takes us into this other domain, which is a domain that is... Um, the word that emerges from a much deeper negotiation with silence, which might have start, started out for Poonam as a powerless silence, but has now turned into, because of this uh, particular negotiation that you talk about, her, um, her experience with the church, her experience of a kind of self-reclamation, it turns that power, powerless silence into a powerful one. And the words that emerge from there seem to be qualitatively different, which is why Jishnu actually wrote that sentence down, which I wanted to share with you. I think at one point, Jishnu asks um, his teacher, he asks Megha, so is this what we are here to learn, how to fake things? And uh, it's, it's an important question there. And he seems to recognize that Poonam is the force without knowing it. This again pointed to a kind of, you know, move from you know, if there is a journey from the unconscious to the conscious and then the problems of this conscious knowledge turning self-conscious, which has its own issues. But here, Poonam is not that. She represents a kind of conscious uh, conduit of something more, which none of the others seem to quite be able to uh, completely understand or, you know, get are, are able to completely comprehend the mainsprings of. So I wondered if you'd like to talk about that, too. You know, what is this, um, what is this uh, space that you sense that Poonam is in some way um, accessing? And how is it different, for instance, from the space that Rory accesses in performance? Because Rory is also this highly trained, um, uh, very rigorous performer who is also able to perform uh, Megha's poetry, for instance. So I wonder if you want to just talk about that. Right, absolutely. I mean, Jishnu, of course, is another name for Arjun. So that yes. is that was my um, take on that moment when Jishnu sees yes. what Poonam is capable of, and he's just kind of um, kind of gives up. Um, but I think the question about language that you mentioned is very um, very powerful, and that was a speculative moment for me because as someone who writes only prose, I mean, of course, I react in a certain way when someone reads out something I do. Uh, but for novelists, I don't think that happens very often. Poets, on the other hand, have to deal with it much more. And I know you are such a beautiful reader of your own work, but I'm sure when you hear somebody else reading your poems, they and that was my speculation. So if I if you will allow me, can I just read a little? Passage here, Please, I, think I think it's the right uh, moment to do it. Yeah. Might um, actually give me, uh, you know, a sense of, um, you know, what I'm trying to say. This whole tension of the poet. Um, had she thrown her life away? She wondered. By throwing away her dissertation, it was a meaningless thought. 
She remembered the dead end, but she always went back to the thought, a drug she couldn't kick. She had taken the leap to follow the life of her poems. They came from anger and hiss like droplets on hot metal. The numb indifference of whiteness, its laughing, joking cruelty. The pain of blackness that she feared but wanted to love. Blackness that had touched her kindly with a glint in its eye. Brown that belonged to her, often invisible to the world. Little slippery stories that crawled in verse, speaking in tongues. They wanted to slap the world. She tried to gain her breath each time they came to life. They struck people and bruised them. A few of her poems had appeared in some of the experimental zines and portals. The reptilian warrior, the lizard with the poison tongue, the archer in an armor of scales had slipped into imagery. They came alive under the weight of a job. A couple of her students showed her that her poems had a spiky afterlife in the spoken word. They knew how to expose her. The words egged on student performances on the various campuses scattered across the Raritan River. And on one evening, popped up in a nightclub. Under the grainy yellow light, a young woman started to read out the poem from her phone, glancing around to find Megha in the crowd. The words crawled on Megha's skin like large hairy ants, and she slipped away, unseen, into the restroom where she locked herself up. They should pretend to be sick or snort stuff, and she did till someone threatened to bang down the door, and she stepped out meekly to take her place in the audience just when the whistling applause was dying down. Grainy light, antsy words. The Instagram videos circulated in student circles, even though Megha cringed every time she heard her own poem performed. She hoped the pain of hearing her words said aloud would help her become a better poet. There was something savage about their sound that she couldn't bear. The thought that she had written them was a slap on her face. They sounded alien. They claimed slimy muscles she did not possess, suffering she had not suffered. How was that possible? They were beautiful, frozen sculptures of rage and print. Why did they bleed so viciously when other people spoke them aloud? Hearing them, she felt she was claiming a pain that wasn't rightfully hers. The fluidity of sound scattered her dishonesty to bits. People loved the sound of her poems. She smiled and squirmed. So, I mean, this was, you know, my attempt. I think all, all of us who write are always haunted by this kind of self sense of self-doubt, various kinds of self-doubt. Mm -hmm. And I think for Megha, it was a um, kind of question of authenticity that I think, and this is um, the part that I know from experience. I've never written anything like this myself, but I know when you're a brown person living in a white country, um, yeah. you, are, you have a certain sense of being on the margin. But at the same time, uh, the pain of blackness, that's a different kind. And she writes poems about different races. And uh, it's one thing to write them, but when they are performed, when she shares the sound, she's grip, gr uh, grappled with a sense of anxiety. That do I have the right to represent this kind of pain? And I think this is what I try to explore when she moves to India. You know, she is suddenly kind of white. She's no longer a brown yes. person herself in a privileged position and then when she meets someone like Poonam um, you know it really pushes her you know what does it mean for a liberal person who is actually open to otherness and for, for a moment she can't write poetry because she loses that sense of being on the margin um, but then I think only when the relationship with Poonam gains a certain crisis she gains yeah. her poetry back and Poonam is kind of a reminder that this is what otherness looks like where you are right now. And that's a that's a kind of a jolt, I think, which many of us who move between the West and India have experienced. And again, though Megha's poetry, I have not written poetry, I haven't written things like that. I try to imagine, but this embodiment of poetry, you know, and this is something probably you can tell me more, what does a poet feel when their words are actually read out by somebody else? You know, does the question of authenticity become more real and more troubling because I know for I always tell my students that you know you write something read out the ear is a very tough master you know things your eye will pass your ear will not pass your will and this is 
happens to her when she's in this pub. She's hearing these and she's and she's like, oh my God, I, I can't deal with this. You know, I have a problem. So, but you know, I don't know. That's that's my speculation. That's something I don't know because I But tell me, point. is it different? Is it different for you now when you were reading your own work right now? You were reading from it. Was it diff was it difficult to read out loud? I have I'm used to reading fiction. I'm used to reading from my novels. So that is mm -hmm. there's always a alienness because I think the fiction writer's relationship with uh, prose is very quiet, very silent. We are looking mm. at it, you know, mm -hmm. we are seeing it. We are not often looking at the sound. But mm. uh, this is something that has really fascinated me for the long time. In in my second novel, The Firebird, it was a theater, you know, because as someone who writes only prose, I'm fascinated by literary forms which have performative yeah. lives. But what does it yeah. mean to be performance? And I think in this novel, therefore, it was a question of poetry. And especially... Yeah which sort of snaps out of the poet's control by getting this kind of life and political poetry you know especially political poetry when it gets its kind of a sound so that was yeah. um, disturbing i imagine this is disturbing to meha and i think in some ways i was disturbed too while writing it i know because that that idea recurs several times in the book and i can see why uh, uh, shaikat i can certainly say for myself that i find it um, there is a definite shift from the printed word or the written word to the spoken word. But I don't often even allow a poem out into the world until I've at least heard it spoken. Because um, I know that the two have to in some way be linked, even if they are not the same, they're not identical. I know that, they, that my poem has to stand in terms of the spoken word and the written on some level for myself. Um, what I often find problematic in performance is perhaps not dissimilar to what you're saying Megha wrestles with, which is, um, you know, I'm uncomfortable when actors take over a poem because often actors tend to perform the poem rather than simply read it. And um, they tend to color the, the, the spaces. They tend to want to uh, fill in and, uh, the blanks with a certain kind of histrionic energy that is not always necessary. So it's yeah. about, uh, I think personally, even for me to read work aloud has been about learning how to stand, not in front of the text, but behind it, not in front of the word, but behind it. So you allow the word, you're in a sense trying to let the word uh, take over and have its um, own life. So that is, uh, that has been a long longstanding um, these have been questions that have been important. It's also been a long-standing journey of how to actually read one's work, you know, not to color it too much, not to paint it too much, to just allow it to be uh, as mm -hmm. much as possible. So I see a reading really as an invitation to the written word. I still see it that way in my mind, but I'm also aware that there are many for whom the experience of the poem happens largely at the reading, the performance, and, um, no place else. And that's fine too. There's, that's a particular kind of uh, listener and uh, whose tribe is growing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm grateful that they're around too. But mm -hmm. to return to the character, Shaikat, I, would, I was actually curious about Megha. You know, for mm -hmm. one, you make her a poet. And I'm curious, I'd like to know more about why that choice was made specifically. Was it to, in fact to explore these areas that we just talked about? Or was there something question. else? I think the question of performance would not be possible if yes. she's, I mean, she yes. might have been a playwright or something, but she had to work in a performative genre. The question of performance was very important because performance, uh, there's something brutal about it. There's something savage about performance, I feel. And I feel, you know, prose is a very genteel genre in some ways. It is linked to modernity and print and the bourgeois forms of art. And, I, and I'm and i happy there, but I have this kind of, you know, longing sometimes for the savagery of the performance. As, as some people know, my mother was a theater actress and, you know, I saw her on stage um, as a child and in some ways, that shaped the writing of my novel, The Firebird. And I have this kind of haunted memory of performative, you know, which is why I love poetry readings. I love poetry. I love reading poetry. Uh, but, I, but I know that, I mean, except a few probably bad lines I wrote for this poem, I don't <laughs> write poetry. But I think it had to be, she had to be a poet. Yeah. You know, and I was also yeah. very drawn by certain, you know, Black American poets, you know, certain kind of questions of race, the way they dress. I think your poetry on poetry and faith 
have been influential mm -hmm. you know, for me over the years. So there are a lot of, so I think in some ways in poetry, they get a certain urgency um, yeah. that I want to capture here. Yeah. Yes. No, I agree. I, that comes through also the great vulnerability, right, of performance, which um, which make her experience this time and again. I think it's the nakedness of it, in a sense, that almost terrifies her on some level. You know, the brutality of it is also because it's so, it strips away so much artifice. And therefore, its inauthenticity also comes to light, if exactly. there is inauthenticity. Exactly. You know? I mean, writing any work of art is letting control of it. You don't control it anymore. Uh, and yet I think the creator can't sometimes help but squirm a little bit. Like you can't do anything about it. So she goes and hides into the restroom. Like I don't want to hear it. You know, like, and these are all in my imagination. But the discomfort yes. that you know, it's theirs, you know, they picked it up and they like it. And that's great. And I think later on when her book poems are published as a book, she's very divided about what, she, what this means, like, you know, she's like, oh, I don't really care about the performance stuff. But then it turns out that she actually doesn't, she's not interested in the reviews. She keeps checking social media about oh, who's doing her poems. <laughs> so there's that yes. division. It kind of imagines yes. a poet like her to exist, you know. <laughs> yes. No, so in fact, tell us more about Megha, you know, because how did you find the spine of this character? Did she just evolve as you wrote her? Is that how it happened? Because she has so many interesting confusions of her own. On the one hand, she's the smart, sassy, bright, edgy woman. And on the other hand, she has these very real confusions, very real uh, ambivalences. She has her own issues of self-loathing. She has lots, uh, lots of doubts of her own. Tell us more about Megha and how she took shape. Right. No, thank you. I mean, it's a really a big departure for me because I think my last two novels have been writing from um, child perspectives. And I think women have always played a big role in my fiction, with the exception of The Scent of God, which doesn't have that many female characters. But I've never written with a female protagonist. You know, I have seen the world from a... And so that was a kind of a challenge. But at the same time, I... Um, you know, wanted to kind of think of what I have in common with her, even though she's a different person, she's a fictitious character. But I think there's a, I know a lot of people like her, you know, people who are poets, you know, obviously I know you, you know, people who are academics, people who teach, people who live in different countries. So I think one way to focus was to focus on what I, what I know, what I have in common with her. And I think what I realized was what I, what really drew me about writing child protagonist is their vulnerability. They're so vulnerable and they're so confused. Uh, and that, I think, is wonderful for a writer when they're hit by experiences, but they don't know quite what to make of that experience. That gulf between experience and understanding is a very powerful space for art, which is why I was nervous about writing about an adult protagonist because I thought, oh, I'm leaving my comfort zone. You know, oh, I'm writing about adults. Now, this is going to be very boring, analytic talk. You know, how can I... I don't have that kind of sensibility. And then I realized I there's a vulnerability in everybody. Even adults are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I, I think Megha's character truly came alive for me when I discovered her misgivings, when I discovered her vulnerability, that in spite of being, in one sense, she's quite successful as a poet, she's struggling with her career and all of that. But most importantly, her spiritual misgiving that oh do i have the right to write the kind of poetry i'm writing even though people like it is it legitimate can i talk about this pain is it not my pain then when she moves so i felt you know creating a fictional character the driving force for me is that the character is always in a process of becoming so mm -hmm. i would want to write a character who knows a lot about things who kind of understands things i think that sense of confusion and even fear and fragility is very important yeah. for me as a fictional character. And that's why I think the character is always growing. So I, I, I sometimes think that all novels are essentially Bildungsroman, because even if this is not the coming of age from childhood to age, it is in some ways about Megha's growth. I mean, primarily in this yes, case, through her relationship with Poonam, that she realizes certain things about herself. But I, I wanted to captured that sense of vulnerability and that sense of growth, which, you know, um, which I think got me going. That is an impetus. And that, I think, affected the language too. The language becomes, you know, I mean, it's it's a kind of a, 
it's kind of a fallible language. The misgiving, the uncertainty gives a certain edgy energy into the sentences, which I think mm -hmm. if one is very, I mean, she's very, you're absolutely right. She's very witty and smart and in control on surface. But I think internally, there are a lot of frailties. And that I think was very, exciting. I mean, far more challenging was, of course, Poonam's voice because she was truly different and Therefore, I think whenever I brought her voice into the novel, it was a kind of an elevated poetic utterance. So I didn't yeah. really give a very quotidian voice to her because her voice was more at a different level. So, yeah. Oh. In fact, that was something I found interesting, Shokat, the fact that none of the characters, not just make her your protagonist, but none of the characters really are, you know, every time I started thinking, oh, maybe this is a type I recognize, there would be something that offered them the kind of texture that I didn't quite anticipate. So even Poonam, who is the counterpoint in some ways to one particular way of looking at uh, life and knowledge, even Poonam has her own doubts, her own uh, pain, which she still has to come to terms with and heal, and her own uh, questions of identity that she has to make peace with. And there is even Jishnu, your Arjuna, who it's very easy to see as this uh, spoilt, entitled brat, who is not one, who also has his own demons, who also has his own cross to bear, um, who also is going to be propelled into a life that he doesn't necessarily want, a public life that he may not necessarily want to lead. So what interested me is the fact that there is this uh, inflection, in a sense, of all these characters. And is this something, again, that you work on consciously, Shaikat, or is it something that happens the more involved you get with these characters as you write them? How did it happen? Right. No, absolutely. I'm glad you read the division in the characters. I think, and this is a, you know, kind of a terrible time to say this because the world is such a terrifying place and there's so much violence around us. But I don't think there's anybody, you know, no matter what the privilege looks like, who doesn't have their demons. You know, it's just different kinds. And of course, we can't compare, you know, people are in war, in violence. But I think everybody has, you know, you know, privileged people have a certain burden of expectation. Creativity has its own demons. Education has its own demons. Even power has its own demons. And I think you're absolutely right. Someone like um, Jishnu, who is um, kind of the Arjuna character in this novel, um, is burdened. You know, he has to lead a certain public life. Um, he's faced with and, and at the same time, he's not happy with it. And this is, I think, the true of, you know, many people who come from power or whether it's business or money, they they don't have freedom. And I think that is something I wanted to explore. And especially the moment when he faces the raw power of Poonam's creativity. He, there's a sense of yeah. helplessness that I can't do anything. So, um, so yeah, I think um, all of them, I think, because privilege and power and education and access are such central questions in this novel. And these are such burning realities around us, especially in a country like India, but everywhere, even in the US, questions of race and class are so powerful that I think um, I ended up exploring this. And I, I don't think one can write a character um, in a flat way. You know, it's, Every no. character has something that is sort of vulnerable or twisted or broken about them and i think it's about discovering that uniqueness not just how a character is a product of their social forces but how they're unique so i'm, I'm very Did you, do you pro no so that brings me to my question actually about process shaykat is this uniqueness something you're aware of at the start or is it something that develops as you write do it, you I actually just... have a list of your characters with a sense of what they're going to represent and who they are did how did you start what was the process here well, as I said, with this particular novel, obviously, you know, you know, Megha was going to be Drona and uh, Punam was going to be Ekala, Vajishnu was going to be Arjun. But clearly that was very tentative. As I started writing, I realized they are kind of out of control. You know, they are kind of out of control. You know, yes. they just do their own thing. And then the myth has so many different angles. No, I... I always feel when I write a character, I write a page of dialogue and I'm like, this character is behaving totally differently from what I imagine them to be. And that's when I know uh -huh. it's working. That loss of yes. control of the novelist is very enabling. Yes. That, oh, you yes. are on your own now. You're not listening to me anymore. You are doing your own thing. That means something is good. <laughs> you know, so definitely. I mean, I start with something. I think with this novel, there was the blueprint of the myth. Um, but oh. definitely 
they kind of went out of control. So yes. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. I know that I must start looking at the chat for questions that might have come, but I'm not sure how I can do this on my phone. So Shaikat, I'm going to ask you to keep an eye on questions that might have come in from listeners. And yes. uh, even as if you find any that you're able to pick out, uh, feel free. If not, I have plenty of my own. Right, right, yeah. Um, I can see there are a um, lot of comments. Um, I'm... Um, yeah, there are most of these are actually common. So I think there is a there is a request for a reading. I, I think I read something now. So I can um, I mean I we, um, these are all comments. There are all I don't think there are any questions as such. Um, I I don't want to. Um, I think uh, people are talking about. Um, um, I think Manmeet is saying drawing the parallel between middle class joining the elite with Drona Pandav and Ekalave set up. Seems so real now that you should show it. Manjul Bajaj is saying a really interesting point about the inter intersection of faith and art. Alok Bisha, mm. she's saying something about atmosphere. So Ruma is saying something about the sense of self-doubt. So there are lots of mm. comments and questions yes. as such. So I'm happy to mm -hmm. uh, read a little passage or if you have other questions. Um, I, you know, I think you should read a passage, but I also would like you to say something more about when this novel was written, you know, the actual process. Did you write it during the pandemic? I did actually. I think I did write it uh, during the pandemic. I think it was um, yeah. very strange. And because, again, I had the myth uh, principle in mind, it came out relatively quickly. But I mm. am the kind of writer, I might finish a manuscript in a year and then I might take five years to revise it. So my revision time is usually many times, you know, <laughs> you know I'm really glad to draw a very early draft and, and certain mm. things stood out. But uh, I revised it, you know, for, for a long time, yeah. many times. So definitely, the, the very strange sense of disembodiment, a sense of unfinishedness, and it was a time for personal loss, you know, kind of, um, you know, um, loss of control. And I think, you know, it was it was a very strange time to write, but that's when it happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you, since yeah. we talked a lot about, um, you know, Megha and Poonam, I thought I'll just read a little bit from a, a from a kind of a exchange between them. And this yes. is the end of the novel. Tell me something, Poonam. She asked, why did you say I was your teacher? She heard Poonam browsing through the shelf. She did not speak. Why, Poonam? She asked that day at the church. Um, it felt odd. She took another sip. You put me on a spot. Why? What's wrong with it? Poonam stepped out, smiled. It just came out of nowhere and kind of hit me. And it was strange having everyone stare at you. What? No one stayed at you. People thank everybody at the church. It's a place to give thanks. Poonam, Megha asked, what did I teach you? I didn't know you spoke so beautifully. What do you know about me, Didi? The Didi stung. The servant's Didi for her mistress. Mistress, The Didi who could be anyone. Honestly, I don't know anything, Megha whispered. What you do with the books you take, the sermons you write for the church, she paused, or the memories you have. I know so little about you, Megha said. How can you call me a teacher? I, I, Megha faltered. I had nothing to do with your learning, Poonam. Poonam smiled. There was soft venom in her smile. Megha was unable to move her eyes from her smile, the alcohol warming her innards. Poonam's smiling eyes floating, dancing. Of course you had nothing to do with it. Her eyes sparkled. You have nothing to do with me, Didi, do you? It was like a slap. A stinging, sweaty slap on Megha's wine softened cheek. Poonam hadn't called her Didi in a long time. She called Megha nothing, just addressing her directly. There was never anyone else around. What are you saying, Poonam? A cloud of despair curled inside Megha. What are you trying to say? She was close. She had the same green salwar she wore in church that day, the stupid green thing that looked so sad next to Jishnu's black cycling outfit. Had she not washed it? Did it smell of her body? When you leave this place, will you remember me? I don't know what you're saying, Poonam. Megha's voice was weak, like that of a little child. I know nothing about you, and you still call me your teacher? I read your poems, Didi. Poonam said softly, it's all there in your poems. There was sweat on her upper lip, beads that looked like a mustache, small flesh-colored bits of mustache, droplets on her dark skin. Why don't you write poems anymore? Her voice swayed, because your poems so much more than you? feel things that you don't? 
they did. What right did they have to feel things she didn't? Stolen emotions. I write poems, Megha said slowly. I don't own them. They leave me once they're out there. What did she see in the stolen goods? Was she fooled by them? Her heart fell bruised, wet with blood. I've learned your poems, Kulam said. I've learned them, Didi. Megha tried to breathe. What had she learned? A fake voice? What had she done to her? I heard them that evening, the Gora man danced. I was there. You didn't see me in the audience, but I was there. And then you came and spoke to me. You were kind. I came home and I read your book, which I could not understand at first, but I read it again and again. And then the scales and the horns and the tails of the lizards and the gecko started to come alive because this is how you think of us. Don't you people from the forests and mountains, people with horns and tails and scales on their skin, horns and tails and scales, the forked tongue. Something went off inside, like live wires touched each other and shrill electric sing her skin. No, Puna, Megha's voice was moist. Never. I don't know you, she said, but that's not how I think of you. Never. I am that, Poonam said sharply, horns and tails and scales. We are. You said nothing wrong. Don't you fucking mock me, she gripped Poonam's hand. She could twist and break it, could she? You don't get it. You whispered, you'll never get it. So, I mean, I um, these are moments which are obviously, you know, very intense and very vulnerable. But I think for the longest time, I also wanted to write a relationship where this kind of quotidian labor and obviously Punam is not a servant to anything. She Their relationship is social, but she comes from a different class. And I was yes. very struck by the intimacy with a certain um, social classes around middle and upper middle class people. And that intimacy mm -hmm. is very strange because it's so much distance and yet there's so much closeness. So there's a part when she appears on the screen while she's talking to her mother on Zoom and her mother says, oh, you got to cook. And Megha gets very disturbed, like, oh, no, 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 of course not. She's not a cook. But she's that curious. relationship is um, very intimate also. And I thought I wanted to say something about that. <laughs> yes. In fact, that's a good point. You know, the, uh, it's a very dramatic scene, the one that you read. But it struck me when I was reading your book that much of it has a kind of lightness of touch. It is, it read, there is an ease uh, in, a, in the way in which the narrative unfolds. There is irony, uh, but it doesn't turn, um, it doesn't turn precious and it doesn't turn uh, brittle. It's not brittle irony. And at the same time, it, and it doesn't get terribly mannered. To me, these were important things as I read, you know, there is a freshness in the language. There is, um, at the same time, you know, what I often look for in a poetic line, for instance, which is uh, just to give you a sense of what I, what I would look for in any kind of writing actually, but particularly in the poetic line, would be the sense of surprise and inevitability at the same time. You know, when the two come together, you know you found your line. And I felt mm -hmm. that several moments here, there was that freshness and surprise, but there was also the sense of not flaunting a craft. You know, there's an unobtrusiveness, a quiet, a subtle um, quality to the writing, which uh, appealed. And uh, I wonder whether you'd like to say something about how it has changed from perhaps some of you, you know, your approach in some of your earlier work, because I seem mm. to remember you talking about irony as a narrative um, device. Right. No, absolutely. I think a lot of writers go through this phase and you kind of write to impress. So I'm clever. I can do things with words. I can write brilliant sentences. And then you get to a point when you realize writing is not about brilliance or impressing. It's about moving people and kind of hitting them um, kind of in their entire sensibility, not just their brain, but their bodies. And I now realize I write sentences with my body. You know, it's not mm -hmm. just but I, there's something it's a very physical process you know I, I remember that wonderful Ted Hughes poem about poets and potters that a pottery is such a physical art and I realized the physicality of it it's such a physical thing and I think that helps you keep it honest because if you're just thinking with your head you can be that snazzy you know snarky thing you know which I think exactly. poets differently but that vulnerability and um, I, I'm, I'm really glad, I mean, that you that you feel that there's a sense of restraint because, um, I mean, you're right, I, the passage I read was probably one of the most dramatic, but for the most part, it is much more understated because, uh, partly because Megha is very uncertain that um, whether she has the right to feel anything, you know, whether she's, what she's feeling, whether that's even right. And, and I think it's a learning. This is why I've also talked about 
learning as a process of unlearning you know often often you learn the most when you unlearn certain things and there's so much unlearning that happens for mega so much unlearning of privilege so much unlearning of craft and i think probably most phenomenally that encounter with religious faith that yes. um, what religious faith can do to poetry you know, which obviously you know more than most poets writing today that what it can do to poet poetry and it's a power that she will never possess but she she can recognize it when she sees it so i think and there's a sincerity there's a sincerity in that learning there's a bareness which i think um i hope i've been able to keep keep that alive and which is exactly why some people ask me that why didn't you show their relationship get closer but i think in some ways there's a vast ocean between them so they, it just can't happen which is why i've realized works of art are always unfinished some people have said that the last scene of the novel feels like the beginning of something i said I, that's exactly what it supposed to be because you know you put a frame but there's always life outside so they will you know who knows there might things happen but there's only so much we can cover so much distance we can go in the space of one novel because they really come from very different worlds yes they do which is why i think the decision to conclude when you do in that no in the novel is um is absolutely the right decision you know there's a precarious moment of connection but one knows how fragile it is and how tenuous it is one wonders where it could possibly head you're left with those questions really and um i thought it was a it was a fine moment to end uh, end your novel but uh, shaykat i'm not sure we are supposed to go on any further because your publishers will not approve of us extending this beyond an hour but yes. uh, there are questions i know that i have i'm sure there are questions that will come up for your listeners but let me just say this in, since we might have to wind this up at this point i'm going to let you have the last word by actually picking something to read shaykat because it's lovely to go away with the sound of the text in one's ears and while yes. shaykat his passage i just want to say to those listening in that um, this is a book to to own so do pick up your copy of the middle finger and uh, it's a book of uh, surprises and at the same time it's a quiet subtle shape shifting book to me that's what makes it a book that um, that excites me shaykh sure, over to you and i mean in the honor of uh, having this conversation with a poet i'll try to read a passage which not 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 the poetry i would go as far as that but i'll read a passage about poetry which i hope will give a sense a very brief passage um the poems had a mind of their own they arranged themselves in the manuscript they knew where they had to go there was spit flying around in new brunswick train station black teenagers packed in a beat up car like packed sardines spitting a brown man from wall street in a basement pub in brooklyn looking for stains on his clothes a queer chicano man looking for an opportunity to throw a glass of red wine on the brown man's shirt indian software engineers from boston driving through harlem piss chilled inside frozen penises for fear of the tattooed men outside singing and guzzling beer the poems became lines and wriggled around snake like tails fishy plates staring you in the eye becoming one long poem over 110 pages would this be our family the book that boiled and simmered where she could send this family of savages where could she send this family of savages they were her babies babies that hatched out of eggs babies crawling into scaly adults with steely eyes treat us all they were poems about body odors on the subway odors of different races and how they felt in the noses of differently colored flesh black flesh felt like sugar and cinnamon on brown nostrils spanish skin smelled like sour cream on yellow nostrils brown flesh was hot and sweaty like moist chili peppers on black nostrils yellow skin smelled fibrous sharp and vinegary on chicana noses they were wicked megha stopped fighting they swirled and swayed and curdled like bilge water and shuffled in the vessel she poured put on some fresh coffee while the machine warmed she spread out her mat and did some crunches she needed to get the poems out of her head they wriggled like worms so i'll stop there i mean i 
dared to get as close to poetry as I could, you know, in this in this uh, in this uh, in this novel. And I'm really delighted to have this conversation with you, Arunthi, because whose poet, poem poetry has been such an inspiration to me in so many ways. And thank you very much, uh, Scroll, for hosting us, and for Simon and Chester, the team, for having this, and all of you who are here for posting all these wonderful comments. You know, I didn't see a question, but there are so many comments about the things we are talking about. And um, I hope we'll continue this conversation on different formats. And um, let me know, you know how you like the book. And thanks again, Arundhati, for doing this. You're really an inspiration. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Sarkat, and all the very best with this book. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>